Okay, uh, good evening, and um, and and I'll make make a start. So my my name's uh, David Stencil, and uh, uh, I'm going to give this public lecture today on uh, cardiac risks of excessive exercise and try and answer the question: Can too much physical activity damage the heart? Um, but before I say that, I should welcome particularly. Um, members of the, the public that have come from off campus. It's really nice to see all of you here um, and so many familiar faces from my colleagues. So uh, I hope I'm not going to disappoint you um, tonight. So th this is the outline. This is what I intend to uh, cover in the talk. So I'm firstly going to start with some anecdotes, um, uh, 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 some you know, little um, stories or, or anecdotes from heart attacks induced uh, potentially by exercise. Um, and then going to look at what does the evidence actually say when people have collected a bit more systematically uh, evidence on heart attack and exercise and, and um, uh, how, pre how prevalent that is. Uh, I'm going to look specifically after that at triathlon and cardiac events. This is an emerging area where some ev evidence is um, suggesting that the, the, f the initial uh, swimming portion in particular of triathlon might, might be dangerous. Um, I'm, I'm going to look at the evidence on running, cardiac events and mortality risk. It's something that was was in the news um, a, a couple of years ago. There were some stories in the news about that around a particular study called the Copenhagen City Heart, Heart Study. So we'll look at that. Uh, and then um, look at some possible mechanisms. Um, what, what might be actually, if, if it's true that exercise increases the risk of it or triggers a heart attack, what might be the mechanisms to explain that? And, and finally, um, look at uh, a, a condition termed atrial fibrillation, which also is emerging as an area p potentially where exercise um, performed over many years, particularly in older adults and more so in men than women, it seems at the moment anyway, m might actually, exercise might actually trigger atrial fibrillation. Apparently this is all being recorded, um, so I won't be telling any rude jokes. Um, but uh, if you want to ask any questions uh, as I go along, please feel free to do that. I'll also stay around at, at the end for a short while. Unfortunately, I've got to go and collect my daughter after that uh, from an e event. But I'll be around for about, I aim to talk for about 40, 45 minutes, and then I'll be around for about 15 minutes. Um, if, you're, if, and if you want to email me, my, my email's up there. Yeah, I'm happy for you to do that. Um, so... You know, firstly, with some anecdotes, this is something that's in the news actually on quite a, quite a regular basis. And, and um, I mean, for many years, uh, myself and, and many others in the profession as exercise physiologists have said, you know, the risk of exercise doing any damage is extremely low. And when we keep on saying that, and, and I should say the evidence, I think, overall st still supports that the, the risk is very low. But unfortunately, every time I, I sort of say that, there's an event that comes out in, in the news and, and possibly one of the most notable ones uh, uh, back in 2012 that, that probably you're all aware of is uh, Fa Fabrice Mwamba um, collapsing on the pitch in a, in a, a game with, with Tottenham versus Bolton. There are some other seats if, if you want to pl please, please come and make yourselves comfortable. Um, there, there's some, some over here. And uh, some at the back there. You're, you're welcome. Yeah. So th this was the, the you know one of the mo most notable um, events where uh, I think technically Fab Fabrice Mwamba possibly was technically um, declared dead for, for sort of 30 to 45 minutes, or um, or in effect dead. There you are. 78 minutes it says following his collapse on on the pitch. But I mean that. That was a success story of re resuscitation and recovery, um, uh, an amazing story. And he's no, no longer playing professionally, but, but, but well, I believe. But there's uh, again quite a lot of cases in the news if you look over the years. So this is um, uh, Mark Vivian Foe, the Cameroon, Cameroonian footballer dying at the age of um, 28 uh, of heart-related death. Uh, um, I was actually giving a talk in, to some students in Japan um, back in uh, 2011 in July, telling them that the risks were very low. And then a, a few couple of weeks later, um, Naoki Matsuda dies, um, uh, one of their World Cup players. Um, this is the Italian footballer, Mor Morosini. Um, and, the, and there are other, other um, cases, or, or most prominently, I think, in the news, linked link to football. Um, 
but but it isn't just football. This was the Norwegian swimmer Alexander Dale Owen. I think that that their um, best hope for a, a gold medal in the 2012 Olympics, dying in the shower just prior to the London Olympic Games. Um, that was May 2012. This, this thankfully wasn't a death, but this is the, the, the cricket player, James Taylor, um, uh, ha having a heart um, disorder picked up and, and that ended his, his uh, cricket career. Um, and, and obviously running, um, this is the London, uh, London Marathon, uh, an army captain dying, collapsing in, in the 2016 London Marathon. Triathlon, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about, but this is one uh, the elite French triathlete dying at the age of 31. And, um, and, and and I could go on. Um, when these happen, uh, it's it's evidence has suggested now that they mo or many of these cases, probably the majority, are triggered by a, a condition termed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this is an enlarged heart, and this is a, a case particularly highlighted in the Daily Mail in, in 2002. Typical, typical Daily Mail headline of fatal dedication of man who ran himself to death. But you can see how fit this chap looks. But, but, but in this case, that they um, attributed this to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, age of 33 he was when he died. Um, so I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that, um, that condition in a short while. Um, so so those, those are the anecdotes, and we see that in the news. What, what does the evidence say? What, what's the actual, can, can we quantify the risk? Um, well, there have been a few studies conducted in, in this area, and we'll look at uh, two or three of these. Um, th this was one published in the New England Journal of Medicine in, in 2000 called the Physician's Health Study, which involved uh, look, looking at U.S. physicians um, with, with 12 years of, of follow-up. And during this time, there were 122 sudden deaths amongst over 21,000 male physicians. And uh, the, so what they looked at is the RR or the relative risk, the risk of sudden death during exercise and for up to 30 minutes after exercise. So this relative, this term relative risk, for those of you that may not know, the, the relative means it's in, in comparison to a situation when people are not exercising. So in this case, in this particular study, then they, they um, quantified the relative risk as 16.9, or we could round that up to 17. So what this is saying, actually, was that amongst these physicians, when they were exercising, or within half an hour of finishing a bout of exercise, they were 16 times more likely to have a, a cardiac event or, or, a, or a sudden death than when they were resting. So in that case, we can definitely say that exercise has increased the risk of, of cardiac death in comparison with the same individuals when they're not exercising. They, they also make the point in this paper, how, however, that the absolute risk of sudden death was extremely low. So here we're contrasting a relative risk with an absolute risk, and these are different <laughs> things. The relative risk often sounds quite dramatic, but the absolute risk is low. So they quantified the absolute risk, as you can see here, as one, one sudden death for every one and a half million episodes of, of exercise. Um, the, the other thing that came out of this study was that your risk of actually collapsing and dying while doing exercise differs depending on whether you habitually do strenuous exercise or, or don't habitually do strenuous exercise. So if we look at... Um, the, the, the table here, so we've got the effect of habitual vigorous exercise, so what people usually do in their daily lives, on the risk of sudden death during and for half an hour after about a vigorous exercise compared with light or no exercise. So here, here we see that the first row is people that uh, habitually do vigorous exercise less than once, one time per week. And in those people, the relative risk of, of vigorous exercise triggering sudden death was 74-fold. So they were 74 times more likely to collapse and die during exercise than when they were resting. If we look at the next row down, those people did usually, habitually between one and four times a week, they did vigorous exercise. So their relative risk was 18.9 was or 19. So it was still an elevated risk but it was much lower than in those who don't habitually do vigorous exercise. 
And the last row there is those that do five or more times uh, uh, vigorous exercise every, every week. And in those people, the risk was 11 or 10.9 or 11. So still elevated, but much, much lower than those who, who aren't habitually doing vigorous exercise. So that, that was the key finding of this American Physicians uh, Health Study. Even before that, actually, there was a, a, a study. Um, this, this looked at the risk of exercise triggering a myocardial infarction, so a heart attack. Um, and uh, the, the, this um, looked again looked at the risk in, in, in people grouped according to their frequency of habitual vigorous exercise. Uh, this study looked at men as well as well as women. And again, we see a similar sort of story compared with the as with the previous study that I've just discussed. So here we've got um, the frequency of heavy physical exertion per week, zero, one to two times, three to four times, and five or more. This is plotted on a uh, logarithmic scale. Um, so you can see that in those doing less or, or doing no vigorous exercise a week habitually, they had a hundredfold increase of, of triggering a heart attack compared with when they were resting. In those that did five or more, the risk was only twofold, just a little over twofold higher than when they were, were resting. Um, the definition of heavy exertion here, um, and, and, and the studies don't always use the same definition, the definition here is, is six METs. And again, if, you, if you're not sure what a MET is, a MET is a multiple of the resting metabolic rate. So six METs would be six, six times uh, as much uh, energy expenditure as when you're resting. If you quantify that, it's, it's probably very, very f fast walking or slow jogging. Um, more recently, there was a paper published in 2012 that looked specifically at running, so cardiac arrest during long distance races. Um, so here, th this, this paper um, uh, analyzed data from over 10.9 million runners. And again, to, let's, put this, let's put this risk in perspective then. In absolute terms, 59 cardiac arrests in 10.9 in million runners is a very low risk. Most of these were men, so more, more men than women. The mean age was 42. And if we want to quantify the incidence rate, it was 0.54 per 100,000 participants. This study also observed a higher incident rate in marathons that, than half marathons, which I, I guess would make sense because you're out there for longer, and a higher incidence in men, men uh, and that has increased in the last decade. They all, also in this study looked at the causes, um, so that here in this table we see survivors and we see non-survivors. Um, and really I'm just showing this table to, to make the point again that what seems to be triggering these uh, cases in uh, the cardiac arrest in the majority of cases is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So I've highlighted those, those values in red. Um, so if we look at the first uh, row in the non-survivors here, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy plus means that, that the autopsy suggested that, that it was an enlarged heart and the plus means there may have been some other comorbidities there. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy on its own means that that was the only triggering event that they could identify. And if we add those uh, red figures up, we, we, cut, we comes to about 50% of the causes of, of um, cardiac arrest are related to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um. There was a consensus statement published in 2007. I, I, I don't think that there's been anything more recent, but, but uh, if, any, if there has, please, please uh, correct me. Um, so, so this um, placed this, this, these risks into perspective quite nicely. Um, so so uh, what, what they said, the, the first point to make is habitual physical activity reduces coronary heart disease risk. There are many studies that have shown that, and that still remains true. The second point, with which I've shown you some of the evidence for, is that vigorous exercise transiently, briefly, uh, increases the risk of sudden death and myocardial infarction, heart attack. Um, so when we say transiently, that, that, that increase in risk is happening while you're exercising, and it's happening for, for at least half an hour, possibly a, a little longer, after you've finished exercising. 
Now, now, what causes that? Well, the third bullet point there, hereditary or congenital, so birth defects or cardiovascular abnormalities are predominantly responsible for these uh, heart attacks when they happen in young, young people. So those, all the cases I showed you of the footballers, in practically all of those cases, it, it, it's, they've already got an underlying genetic predisposition due to an enlarged heart with thicker walls and the exercise has then triggered that, but there is an un underlying condition that's there. When it happens in older adults, it's usually different. So the uh, atherosclerosis, underlying cardiovascular disease, hardening and narrowing of the arteries, the coronary arteries in particular, is primarily responsible for these events when they happen in older adults. And finally, the incidence of both acute myocardial infarction and sudden death is greatest in, in the habitually least active individuals performing sudden un unaccustomed exercise. Um, okay, so, so uh, th that's a, a little look at, at the evidence and, and, and placing um, some statistics on what, what the risks actually are. I'm going to take a quick look at triathlon because um, there hasn't traditionally been lots of data on triathlon, but, but there's been, um, th there is emerging data now. Um, I mean, why I think triathlon is quite important is there's a lot of... Um, what they call the mammals, middle-aged men in lycra, doing, uh, and, and to a lesser extent women, but, uh, you, you know, having these midlife crises, and um, that's probably unfair of me, but, but, but you know, but, um, and there's a bit of machoism that goes with this as well, and you see, and so this is the um, CEO, Paul Reynolds, uh, of Canical, dying after a triathlon-related uh, incident. Um, that was in the news in 2015. And, and of course, um, uh, Others as well. This was somebody that went missing in a lake during a race in Kent, and I think they, they put that down to cardiac arrest um, there. Um, and this was Scientific American speculating, well, why is swimming the most deadly leg of a triathlon? Well, 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 firstly, we need to know, is there actually evidence for that? And there isn't much evidence out there, but, but, but it is emerging now. So this was a research letter um, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association back in 2010, and they looked at um, deaths in triathlon events, um, uh, and you can see there were 950, oh, over 959,000 participants. And again, so it's, it's rare, because they, that was the participants, I think this, yeah, this is USA triathlon sanctioned events. Only 14 deaths out of those um, uh, 900,000 participants. If you look at the next row down, there's the race segment we see swimming, 13 of those 14 deaths, or 93% were in the swim, one, one in the bike ride and, and none on the runs. They didn't really find any pattern uh, in the swimming events of, of, of the length of the swim. So six in short swims, four in medium swims, four in, in long swims. There was a pattern for more deaths in males uh, than females. And worryingly, you know, the number was incre has been increasing over the years. So two in 2006, four in 2007 and eight in, in 2008. Um, so there's, there seems to be something going on with, with triathlon and with swimming in triathlon. Um, that's a research letter um, uh, uh, just last month actually published in the Annals of Internal Medicine was this paper, Death and Cardiac Arrest in US Triathlon Participants from 85 to 2016, when this was a case sort of series report where they just went out looking for, for cases. Um, and this confirmed, really, the, the research letter that, that was published in 2010 in JAMA. Um, so that, that the key findings of this were that 85% um, um, of these um, uh, deaths and cardiac arrests were in um, uh, men, and that, and that they were, um, most of them were in the swimming segment of, of the triathlon. Um, again, if we want to quantify it, um, we, we see some figures are given here. So 1.74 events per 10,000 uh, participants, 2.4 in men, 0.74 in women per, per 100,000. Um, and the risk substantially increased with age um, and was much greater for those aged 60 years and older. So if you're 59, go and do that triathlon now. Um, uh, that they also identified that um, in, uh, in, in autopsy that, that there were cardiovascular abnormalities most frequently atherosclerosis, uh, which links in with, with the uh, 
conclusion I made earlier. And, uh, and so that they conclude that deaths in cardiac arrest during triathlon are not rare. I mean, that, that's, that's their conclusion. And they, they occurred most often in middle-aged and older men, mostly in the swimming event. Um, I don't think there's any definitive um, conclusion yet or evidence of why it's happening in the, the swim. There has been some speculation. Um, the swim event is typically the first event in a triathlon. And, uh, and it's been speculated that there's a, a, um, quite a profound elevation in catecholamines, adrenaline, noradrenaline, um, at the start of a race. And so that, that just happens to be swimming because it's triathlon. And that when you've got this, this high increase in, in adrenaline, that, that you're more likely to develop an arrhythmia. Um, and if that's a ventricular arrhythmia, that's extremely dangerous and, and would, could cause a cardiac event. Um, there's also some speculation that this is happening more often in novice triathletes than, than in, um, uh, in, in well-trained triathletes and, uh, and that they may, this may be their first exposure to open water and, and that in combination with the elevated um, adrenaline and, and the, um, the, the, the general crowded crowds in, in the water at that time you know, may, may contribute. Um, okay, so, so that's, that's a little bit on the emerging area there of triathlon and swimming in triathlon. Um, what, what about more specifically running and cardiac events and, and also mortality risk? Um, so James O'Keefe, if, if any of you are interested to pursue this further, is a cardiologist in particular that, that is quite vocal about the, the damage he believes exercise can do to the heart. And if, if you're really interested to follow up on this, that he, if you Google James O'Keefe TED Talk, you should, he does a really eloquent 20-minute um, TED Talk on, on this. Um, and he's published some nice, nice papers. And the, the um, quotation I've, I've highlighted here is, uh, if, if one is trained to be able to run at speeds of above 7.5 miles per hour, which for runners, um, particularly run, younger runners, really isn't that, that fast. Um, this is better done for some reason other than further improvements in life expectancy. So, so he, he says, run for your life at a comfortable speed and not too, too far. Um, and and he, you know, he, he's got some nice literature if you want to look, look at that. I'm just going to go through a couple of studies that aren't focused on runners, um, but, but just do give us some insights into this area. So... For all of my colleagues in, in the room, they'll be very familiar with this um, Harvard Alumni Health Study that, that's Ralph Pattenbarger's work. And, um, the um, American epidemiologist um, published an awful lot of work showing the benefits uh, um, of, of uh, uh, regular exercise. But this is one of the classic slides from, from Ralph Pattenbarger's work where he um, quantified people according to the amount of uh, physical activity they did in a week. So this index is in kilocalories per week. The least active people are here, so they do less than 500 kilocalories per week of exercise. And then we, we go through each category, so an increase of 500 each time, um, until you reach the group um, doing 3,500 or more, 3, or more um, expending 3,500 or more kilocalories per week in activity. Now, that doesn't really mean very much, but if you wanted to quantify that, to give an example, we, we have a rule of thumb that, that if you walk a mile, it expends about 100 kilocalories. And so less than 500 kilocalories means these people are, are doing the equivalent of less than five miles of walking a week, really not very much. And then we, th this group at the other end are doing the equivalent of about 35 miles of walking per week. Um, and, and, and the take home message from this slide is that the more activity you do, the lower the risk of, of, of all cause mortality of death from any cause. So that, that's the good news. That this last group here raises the question mark, is there a point at which you know, too much exercise begins to be damaging? So here, so this is the group with 0.62. So, so this group have a 48% lower risk of dying during the observation period than, than the least active group, but obviously their risk is a bit higher that than the group before them. So this raises the question, is, is this the point where, where you, you know, um, the relationship starts to turn? Um, also, again, the, the, this study is not related to running per se, but this is a study in Taiwan which had over 400,000 men and women. Um, and uh, this is daily physical activity duration in minutes, 
and all-cause mortality reduction. Okay, so as you go up the y-axis there, that, that's a good, that, that's better. The higher you go, the, the greater the reduction in the risk of death during the observation period. But the, the reason for showing this, this slide is that we see a plateauing. So the, the, the vigorous exercises are those with the blue broken line there. And we see that once we get about past about, or, or up to about 40 to 50 minutes, that has plateaued there, suggesting that, that more exercise isn't going to be beneficial, more vigorous exercise and it possibly might, might turn the other way. When we look at the moderate exercise, that's the broken green line, the lowest line there, and we see that, that in that case, you, you have to reach about one and a half hours of exercise per day before that plateauing seems to occur, and the red uh, line in the middle with percentages above it, it is the overall risk in the, in the whole group regardless of intensity of exercise. So that, that the point here is there, is there seems to be a plateauing after a certain amount of exercise, and that seems to occur earlier if you talk about vigorous exercise. So that, that's not specifically running, and neither is this again, but this is a look at cardiorespiratory fitness. So now we're not looking at, we're looking at a characteristic rather than a behavior now, how fit, fit people are, and do you get protection from being fitter? And in this study, um, fitness is, is quantified in METs, these multiples of the resting metabolic rate, so we see that um, in this particular study, the highest risk of death um, was in those that, whose exercise capacity was less than seven METs. So that's our, um, that's our least fit group there, and they had the highest risk of death. And, and as we go through, as people were fitter, the, the risk of death was lower. But again, the, point, the reason for showing this is we seem to get a plateauing. Once you get to about um, 10 METs, really, which, again, as physiologists who, who study people who are extremely fit, this 10 METs value wouldn't be regarded as extremely fit. You certainly don't need to be going out, going out and running every day or even, you know, four, four days a week to get that kind of exercise capacity. So, so, so again, there seems to be a plateauing here, um, suggesting you, you don't need to do too, too much. Um, and this specifically looking at running distance here, and the risk of all-cause mortality, um, this is, it's, it's evidence like this, which is beginning to, to, to perhaps prompt people to think, well, may, maybe we ought to introduce some limits here. So this, is, this suggests a U-shaped association. People doing, in this, this example, no running a week have been assigned a relative risk of one, and we see that those that are running um, up to 4.9 miles a week, or five to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 20, in each of those four groups, their hazard ratio is lower. They seem to be protected um, from all cause mortality. But in those doing more than 20 miles a week, um, whilst they're still a little lower than the reference group, the relationship has turned. So if we look at this specifically, we might say that 20 miles a week of running might, might be the limit if we're purely interested in, in enhancing our health. And this was the study that made the headlines in, 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 on the BBC News. So training very hard, as bad as no exercise at all. So this was data from the Copenhagen City Heart Study. Um, uh, if we look at what they actually did, they, they quantified, um, or, uh, or they classified rather, um, runners in their study as either light joggers, so um, that is the... Um, those, the L there in, in the table. Um, moderate joggers, the M there, and strenuous joggers, um, based on their self-reported pace of running, so how fast they report self-report running, the amount of running they do, the total quantity of running, and the frequency, how frequent. It, it, it's a little complicated there, but, um, but, but basically, the, the faster the pace, the greater the volume, of running and, and the greater the frequency, the more likely they are to be classified as, as strenuous and, and conversely for those classed as light. Um, and, the, and this was the, uh, the this was the finding that prompted that headline about strenuous exercise might be as bad as doing no exercise at all. So um, here you see the, don't, the, the first set of data is adjusted for age and sex. So, of course, if you're older, you're more likely to die, so you've got to adjust for that. And, and similarly, they adjust for whether you're male or female, because there are different risks in those two sexes. 
So you see the sedentary joggers are our reference group. They're given a hazard ratio of 1. And we see that in this study, the light joggers had a, a much lower hazard ratio um, up here. And the moderate joggers, a lower hazard ratio. So they seem to be protected by their running. Although this is an observational study, we can't attribute cause effect. But when we look at the strenuous joggers, um, they, they don't appear any different. And actually, that risk go, goes up to 3.6 times higher or, or 8, .8 times higher when, we, when, when they're adjusted for age, sex, smoking, alcohol intake, education, and, and diabetes. So that, that was the basis of that, that, um, that uh, headline training very hard, as bad as no exercise at all. If you look a bit carefully at that, though, you see that in the strenuous jogger group, there actually were only two deaths. And, um, and so several people pointed this out, you know, that this could very easily just be a statistical artefact. And hence the BBC changed their mind a, a few months later and put, why strenuous runs may not be so bad for you after all. So, so do, you, do your homework before you put your headlines out. Um, this is the, 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 the um, uh, fairly well-known case of Mika True, um, uh, and, and this is the speculation in Runner's World, did, did um, running cause Mika True's death? So if you don't know about this you know, very interesting man, that um, uh, American who, I mean, this is, this is what I've managed to divulge actually from, from the web, so I won't, you know, I, I, I think this is authentic, and I've read it in several sources now, but but apparently dropped out of modern civilization um, and went to live with the, these um, Tarahumara Indians in Mexico who nicknamed him the White Horse, um, Cabello Blanco White Horse. And it's reported that he often ran distances of 25 to 100 miles in a day. Um, and in March 2012, he was on a 12-mile train run in New Mexico and, and he dropped dead. And I think it took a few days to find his body, but he, he was 58 when he died and an autopsy um, classified uh, or, or classed his death as unclassified cardiomyopathy. They actually didn't have any medical records on him because apparently he never visited a doctor. And, and uh, as you can see, he looks um, he looks extremely healthy there. But but that was the classification of his death. Obviously, that that's anecdotal there. So, what are the possible mechanisms by which exercise might, might um, trigger a heart attack? Well, well, I've mentioned two or three times now hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So what is this? It's an inherited, um, oh, I got this from the British Heart Foundation, by the way. It's an inherited disease of the heart muscle, um, in which the heart muscle walls, both the left and right ventricle, are thickened. And thickened walls compromise cardiac function. So obviously, if you've got a thicker wall, it's harder actually to, to pump blood around the body. But also, these thickened walls um, can compromise the conduction of the electrical signal within the heart muscle. So they can cause um, dangerous, any arrhythmia in a ventricle is, is dangerous in particular. And it's reckoned that about 1 in 500 people in the UK um, have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, there are other studies looking at other aspects that, that suggest that exercise might be damaging to the heart, although I've got to be honest with you, whether this is um, just a transient effect or whether this is actually very genuine damage. We're not, not really sure. So in, this is a particular study where they looked at um, uh, a uh, protein called cardiac troponin, which is a protein found in cardiac muscle and wouldn't normally be present in the blood. And if somebody's had a heart, if you take a blood sample after a heart attack and some, if, if somebody's had a heart attack, you will find elevated levels of cardiac troponin. So it's a standard biomarker for diagnosing a cardiac event or a myocardial infarction. And this is, these are the values in each of the 71 participants of the Boston Marathon um, in 2011. And you can see there's, there's a range, so some of them get very little elevation. But in, in, in quite a few of these runners, the, the cardiac troponin um, levels have been increased um, or, or appear to have been elevated by, by the, the marathon. Now, as I say, whether that's just a transient, benign um, uh, episode or, or, or whether th there is long-lasting damage as a result of that, uh, don't know. Um, this is some uh, more convincing evidence, albeit not in humans, but in trained rats. So, so in this study, what they looked at was um, a 16-week training study um, 
in, in and, and had two groups of rats, they had a sedentary group, so that's shown by the orange bars there. And they had a train group, and an exercise group, which is shown by the blue bars there. And we see th these are the um, findings at four weeks, these are the findings at eight weeks, and these are the findings at 16 weeks. And actually there weren't any significant differences until um, 16 weeks here. And what these actual bars are showing is, um, so, so these bars over here, RVFW, that's right ventricle free wall. So that's the outside wall of the right ventricle, not, not the, the, the septum, not the middle, the, the, the wall between the two ventricles. And um, here you can see already at four weeks, that's higher in the exercised group uh, um, than the, than the uh, untrained group. And th this is percentage fibrosis. So that's what we're looking at. What percentage of the uh, uh, right ventricle free wall has fibrosis? And we see that that's 4% uh, um, there. It rises to 5% in the trained in the exercised animals by, by 16 weeks, which is twice as high as in the sedentary group. Didn't find any differences in the intraventricular septum, so the wall between the two ventricles, or in the left ventricular free wall. So it seems to be the right ventricle where the, where the damage is being done. Um, and so th this is fibrosis they've measured, and, and so fibrosis, as, uh, as I've indicated there, is a, a thickening and a scarring of connective tissue, usually result, as a result of injury. Um, and the, the, the significance of fibrosis, again, is that it can interfere with the electrical activity of the heart and can lead to arrhythmias. Um, and uh, you see the histology here, where, where actually can show that this is the sedentary uh, rats, this is the uh, exercised rats, and these red patches here are where they're, they're detecting this fibrosis which fairly convincingly, since this, this is a, a, uh, a study with a control group and an intervention group, seems to suggest that this, this, is, this is 60 minutes of daily running for, for 16 weeks in, in these rats. Um, so if I, if I summarise this before going on into the last section then, so what we can say is people who exercise regularly have lower rates of disability and a mean life expectancy um, that, that's seven years longer on average than their inactive contemporaries. I should say this is a, a summary from, a, from an article o o on the, the physiology of, of heart, potential heart damage with exercise. However, a safe upper dose limit potentially exists beyond which the adverse effects of exercise may outweigh the benefits. I should say that I think it's very hard to, to actually quantify what that um, upper safe dose limit might be, and I think it might vary a lot depending on, on, on the individual. Chronic exercise, uh, intense and sustained exercise causes patchy myocardial fibrosis, particularly in the atria, um, intraventricular septum and right ventricle. Uh, I mean, the, the intraventricular septum, that didn't show in the study that, that I just showed you, but when they summarized the evidence overall, they've concluded that creating a substrate for atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. Chronic, I haven't shown you all of this evidence here, but they also concluded that chronic excessive sustained exercise is associated with coronary artery calcification. So this is the inclusion of calcium into the coronary arteries, which would, would harden and stiffen the arteries. Diastolic dysfunction, so when the heart's at rest, there's a dysfunction, and large artery wall stiffening. And then moving on then, to in, we'll take a brief look at atrial fibrillation. They concluded that, that ven, veteran endurance athletes, i.e. marathon runners, ultramarathon runners, professional cyclists, may have up to a five-fold increased prevalence of atrial fibrillation, um, which I'll define in a minute. And, and lastly, intense endurance exercise op, efforts often cause an elevation in biomarkers indicative of bio, myocardial injury, um, which, which are uh, and those correlate with transient reductions in right ventricular function. So I, I mentioned troponin, and there's another B-type natriuretic peptide here. So these are biomarkers for myocardial injury. Though, it, again, I, I will emphasise that whether there's been an injury with, with the, these, these transient exercise bouts, don't know, but they're, they're used as markers. And they do actually correlate with reductions in the uh, right ventricular ejection fraction. So the amount of blood that can be ejected from the right ventricle 
uh, is, is reduced sometimes after a, a prolonged endurance event. That's, prob that's a transient thing, and, and there's a recovery. The question is whether, whether over the long-term damage is being done. Okay, look, last thing to just to take a quick look at is, is um, atrial fibrillation. Um, so atrial fibrillation uh, may be defined as uh, uh, chaotic electrical activity um, that re replaces normal sinus rhythm. So it's very erratic. Um, and uh, as I put there, it limits the contribution of atrial contraction to left ventricle filling. So obviously, um, we all know that blood from the uh, left atrium is emptied in, into the, the left ventricle. And if you lose that, because the, the, um, conduct, because the contraction is erratic, it's just fibrillating rather than actually squeezing all the blood out of the atrium and into the ventricle. That means that less, less blood is, is being um, pushed into the, the left ventricle, and hence it's reducing um, cardiac output. It's, it's reducing the amount of blood that, that is ejected from the heart. So your pump, if, probably the best way of phrasing this, the pump it is compromised and, and is pumping less blood and therefore less oxygen than it normally would be. That actually isn't the major problem with atrial fibrillation. You can survive pretty well with, with, with atrial fibrillation and it could be fairly benign in, in, in most people from the point of view of, well, it, 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 would, it would definitely compromise your running ability, but you, you can function on a daily basis. Most people can walk around fine and do daily activities fine. The real problem with atrial fibrillation is it increases your risk of a stroke uh, because blood falls in the atrium uh, and it, it, it doesn't get empty, emptied, some of the blood doesn't empty, it stagnates, it clots, it can adhere to the side of the, the atrium and at a later date that clot will get dislodged and make its way eventually up to the brain causing a stroke. So that's the, that's the single strongest risk factor for stroke, stronger than high blood pressure for example. Prevalence in the UK, about 2% of the population, but, but amongst all of us, there's a one in four lifetime risk of developing atrial fibrillation. And similarly in America, we see 2% of young people, 9% of older people with atrial fibrillation. So the question here is, can something that we associate with, with a healthy habit, exercising, actually be unhealthy uh, for the heart and uh, increase the risk of a stroke? And again, this is something that's been picked up in the news. So athletes beware endurance training may make it more likely that you will need a pacemaker scientists believe and where is the evidence for this well actually there is there is evidence emerging that this is a review paper um, published in uh, 2012 and in this paper they looked at the prevalence of atrial um, uh, prevalence and risk of atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter AFL um, which is a related condition um, in, various, in various groups of, um, of athletes. Um, this isn't, it's not comprehensive. It, I would say it's an early or preliminary type of study. We can see that the age range varies from 26 in the elite athletes through to 60, mid, mid to late 60s in these, these latter groups here. Most of these studies are in men. So 100% of the participants in most of them are men, but study three, is 50% men, 50% women, and, and, and study one is, has about 30% women. And then we see percent AF. Um, some, of these, some of these studies have a control group, so this second study here, non-elite marathon runners, 4.9% had atrial fibrillation, controls only 0.7%. If we look at orienteers, these veteran elite orienteers, 5% of them had atrial fibrillation, 9% of the controls. Cross-country skiing, um, uh, a type of activity characterised by, by very high levels of endurance fitness, but, but um, quite prodigious amounts of endurance exercise, and the prevalence there they found in those veteran cross-country skiers was nearly 17% of them had atrial fibrillation. Again, they were, they were an older group, uh, 60, 69 years of age on average. Again, for, if we look at animal studies, there is evidence from animal studies that exercise actually can trigger atrial fibrillation. So this is the um, uh, title of this paper, Atrial Fibrillation Promotion by Endurance Exercise. And in this paper, they exercised rats um, over 16 weeks and were able to demonstrate that uh, when they got these, these rats um, to do daily exercise, one, one hour daily, that... Um, those in the, the trained group were more likely to develop atrial fibrillation over the, uh, over the uh, 16 weeks.
However, again, to add to the complexities of this and what makes it so difficult to, to generalise is that you can find reports of people who do huge amounts of exercise and have completely normal heart function. So this, this is a case report, a six-time Ultraman winner and a normal heart a, a case report. So if you look at what this chap does or did, 47-year-old um, male, six times Ultraman winner, 50,000 hours of training and competition, 35-year-long career, 25 to 30 hours a week of training. So that's 25 times higher than the recommended dose for health. Um, when, when they investigated this man's heart comprehensively, they found no major abnormalities in the electrocardiograms, whether that was in rest or during exercise, transthoracic echocardiogram and MRI scanning. So no enlargement of the heart, no, no thickening of the walls, no, no abnormal electrical activity. In fact, after his complete evaluation, his heart was found to be quite normal. So, you know, it's going to be hard for me or any other exercise physiologist to tell somebody you're doing too, too much exercise. We can only present the evidence and let people make their own minds up. Um, but but that, that's his um, personal sport history, and you can see it started from sort of six years old all the way through and he did a huge amount of exercise and, and, and nothing wrong with his heart. So the key points here at the moderate levels, uh, this is fairly preliminary still, I still think we need a lot more on atrial fibrillation, but moderate levels of exercise reduce the risk of atrial fibrillation. Very high physical activity levels seem to increase the risk or at least are associated with a higher risk. I should point out the effect is modest, so it's not a very strong effect and, and there doesn't appear to be an effect on mortality. So even if doing a lot of exercise is likely to trigger atrial fibrillation, there isn't any evidence at the moment that it's likely to shorten your, your um, mortality. And there isn't enough evidence to, to, to give a firm threshold at, at the moment. Um, and the evidence is still coming out. So this was a paper published in the British Medical Journal just, um, well, actually 2015. They looked at exercise capacity, so how fit you were, um, muscular strength and the risk of vascular disease and arrhythmia in over a million Swedish men. And again, seem, seems to confirm that um, they found a, a direct association with the risk of AF. So the fitter people were, the more likely they were to have, have AF. And a U-shaped association with bradyarrhythmia. So this is an abnormal slowing of the heart and that, that, the risk of that was highest in either sedentary people or very active people. But moderately active people uh, seem to have some protection. And, and a study in, uh, confirming this, this, again, just a Journal of the American Medical Association, confirming that um, long-distance skiers have a higher risk of atrial fibrillation, but even amongst long-distance skiers who'd had a stroke and had atrial fibrillation, their overall risk of mortality was not, not elevated. So, uh, to summarise, um, vigorous exercise transiently increases the risk of a heart attack, but the overall risk remain, remains low. Um, a habit of regular moderate exercise appears to be beneficial, both for longevity, um, um, or, sorry, it appears to be beneficial for longevity, but excessive levels may be detrimental or may at least pull you back to, to the same state as if you didn't do any exercise. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the major factor underlying cardiac death in young people with, with exercise. Atherosclerosis is the major triggering factor with exercise in older adults. Um, and if you want to know what an older adult is, by the way, I was very depressed sitting in a presentation where I was told that if you're above 50, you're an old, older adult. So. I'm now officially an older adult. Um, emerging evidence suggests a link between prolonged endurance exercise performed over many years and atrial fibrillation, um, but we can't really give a, a threshold for that at the moment. And I'm happy to take any questions, and thank you for listening. Hi, Keith. I know in certain countries there's, there's 
quite comprehensive screening, so in Italy, we know that there's certain groups are actually precluded from doing exercise mm -hmm. because of the screening. Have you got any, can you sort of comment on that? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, I've read various things about screening, uh, including um, uh, sort of letters in, in the New England Journal of Medicine, some supporting screening and some arguing against screening. I've spoken with various people about it, people that do research in this area. I, I, I've got from, from, from what I've read from that, that, that I think most people on the whole believe that screening would be beneficial. I don't know that the evidence, you know, if, if we want to look at hard data to show that screening has saved lives, I don't know that the evidence is yet sufficient to support that. I believe the case you mentioned in Italy, they strongly believe that that their, their data does, does support that. Um, but, but, you know, the, the, the caveats are that, that I've been told, and again, I, I don't have um, written evidence of this, but I've been told that Fabrice Moamba was screened at least four times and cleared, but, but he still had, had a heart attack. Um, and so, so the, the question comes up about false positives and false negatives. And so if you get a false positive, which you won't know it was a false positive, and you're telling that professional footballer to stop their, to end their career, you know, that, that's quite a profound um, you know, thing to do. Um, uh, but I mean, I suppose my own thoughts are, well, at the very least, why don't we screen um, and give people the information, and at least they can make their own informed decision about it. I think obviously the other thing that then comes in is the cost of doing it. So I believe all, all the FA clubs do, do screening, but if you were to roll that out to everybody that does exercise, the cost of doing that, and it then comes down to a cost-benefit analysis, is it worth it? So I haven't given you a concrete reply, but those of you, you're, you're probably aware of those issues. What's all this lifelong exercise? Of course, put it this way. What is exercise doing? Yeah. Um, so, as an exercise, no, most of us as exercise physiologists will, um, you know, be aghast at a pill that could replace exercise. <laughs> Impossible. Um, you know, we, 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 we shy away from pills because we can leave all the medicines have side effects, but obviously, within limits, of course, there are pills that do very good things. Um, I mean, I, I could rattle off a whole load of potential benefits of, of, of exercise um, that, that I think... Benefits. What is it doing? What, what do you mean, what is it doing? Sorry. Well, it's doing something to the body with a long time. Yes. So, it, so it's, I mean, the evidence would say that for, by multiple mechanisms, it is lowering the risk of, of a heart attack in most people. That's lowering the risk of cardiovascular disease because it lowers blood pressure, for example, keeps blood pressure at normal levels, so as blood pressure starts to rise, which typically happens with age, you, you know, your heart is then working um, harder, and you're much more likely to have a stroke. You know? And by the time you get to your 60s, I think something like two thirds of the population, maybe even three quarters of the population, have hypertension. So exercise is one factor that can help to lower the risk of hypertension development. So do you that, that do we know the mechanism by which yes, yeah, I mean. Yeah, lots of the mechanisms around exercise are, are just the repeated amounts, uh, repeated effects of, of acute bouts of exercise. So if I do a walk today and I go to the lab tomorrow, and sit in the lab all day, and, and, me and somebody measures my blood pressure, we have good evidence. Many studies have shown that there is a phenomenon in terms of post-exercise hypotension, reduced blood pressure, and that lasts for at least 24 hours, well, depending on the amount of exercise you've done, and that can just be walking. Um, we, we, we published papers where people have just done 10 three minute bouts of walking throughout the day, we brought them back the next day and measured their blood pressure throughout the day and it's lower than on a day when they didn't walk. And if you replicate that, if you do that walking on a daily or perhaps every other day basis, you will permanently benefit from the last bout of exercise. So that's a transient effect and that's why, why they say we should break the exercise. That's what one example. Exactly the same happens for the way you process fat after meals. So if, you, if you're walking every day or running or doing other forms of exercise, 
then when you're having meals, it's lowering the lipemic response. You're getting, you're, the increase in fat concentration in the blood is not so great. And again, that's an acute effect. There's also evidence that there are structural changes to the heart. So there, there is evidence that, um, that exercise widens the coronary arteries. So even if you get atherosclerosis that narrows the arteries, if your arteries are being widened, the atherosclerosis doesn't block them. Um, but I mean, there's a whole host of other mechanisms. I think. I mean, there's even there's evidence, there's randomised controlled trials where that with in older adults, walking them for a year using MRI scanners to measure brain size and brain function, and they actually have shown an increase in left left hippocampus size, right hippocampus size in walkers versus people who do stretching, and and that that correlates with cognitive function. There's lower decline in cognitive function in those who exercise than those who don't. So, so you know, there's, I could go on, there's bone mineral density increasing and preventing or reducing the risk of a, a, a fracture with a fall. And so, so there are lot, lots of um, uh, potential mechanisms. Um, <laughs> so, I, so I don't think you'll get any pill that will have such multiple effects yeah. Well, there are good companies trying. Yeah. yeah. Of you course. Get all of them so, so since I was a student, you know, I, one of one of my interests is, is weight control, and, and I've been reading about pills to, to cure obesity or reduce it over 30 years, and still we haven't got a pill. And as fast as they come on the market, after all the rigorous testing, you know, Food and Drug Administration. Um, uh, permission and trials, they, they're on the market and then they come off the market because they're associated with side effects and so on. So, I, personally, I remain to be convinced. So I'm not, I, you know, I don't dispute that statins are great for lowering cholesterol and that, that other drugs are good for lowering blood pressure um, and, and that some people will need statins because exercise isn't a panacea. If you've got familial hyperlipidemia, exercise isn't going to be a solution for you. But, but for the majority of the public, it, it will be, I, I, I think. With you. I don't know if the mechanisms are entirely the same, but uh, I think they are related. Um, and I think um, heart failure, it, you know, you have thickened walls, and, and, it, and over years and years and years, those are, that the, that the heart is, is permanently overworking, the walls are uh, possibly getting thicker and thicker, you know, and that eventually leads to heart failure. Whether congenital hypertrophic cardiomyopathy dooms you to heart failure in the future, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't, don't know the evidence well enough on that. So I'd have to, I'd have to go and look at the papers a bit more to, to answer that categorically. But one might suspect that there would be a correlation. And does that make exercise dangerous in that category? I think exercise is definitely da dangerous. Oh, oh, in heart failure patients. Same like an older population. With yeah. Heart uh, I think clearly exercise would be dangerous, but there are intervention trials in heart failure patients, and I believe there's some evidence that it's beneficial. But clearly, it's got to be appropriate forms of exercise and with appropriate proportions. Yeah. Do all the benefits of the possible problem that we've talked about, but they apply also to vigorous exercise in the gym, because some people only do their exercise in the gym. Yeah, I think they would, the, the basic um, uh, relationships that I've shown would apply to any, any type of vigorous exercise. I mean, the, the, you know, squash is one example that's typically given because that, you know, you, you, um, that can get extremely vigorous and there's the excitement of the game and so on. Um, shoveling snow in, in winter when you don't want to do exercise is another example that's given. I think any, any form of vigorous exercise, and what's vigorous for one person may not be vigorous for another person, of course, so it's relative to your own capacity. 